Hello, everybody. Welcome to Paranormal Into the Night radio show. I am Dino Ewald, and uh, we are going to have Gary Wayne on here in a second. Uh, let me get the goodies out of the way. Uh, we are back up and running. Uh, main page, www.patnradionetwork.com. Uh, you guys can search Paranormal Into the Night on Spreaker and give us a follow. Follow so that you know when we are on the air and we go live. Because we do got three shows uh, throughout the week going right now. We got this show every Saturday at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, Paranormal Into the Night radio show. Um, we got Voices Carry now, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Voices Carry with Terry Todd and Amy Farley. Uh, they talk paranormal and all that good stuff too. So, uh, And Monday nights, uh, me, a new show, it's called The Darkening. We will talk paranormal, horror, crime, and uh, this coming, I do this with my co-host, uh, Ted Workman, and what we do is uh, our thing, so it's kind of different than kind of any other show, we, a little whimsical, but we, this Monday coming up, we got the, we'll be talking about the Slenderman murders, um, so check us out, uh, there's an event on the Facebook page, PITN Radio Network. And uh, also, Paranormal Into the Night Facebook group. Uh, I am live there right now, and I will be checking to see if there's any questions. Uh, everybody, feel free, of course, to ask questions, because uh, Gary will for sure, um, you know, answer them. So let, let me see. I'm going to refresh the page real quick, and then introduce Gary Wayne. Make sure I'm live on Facebook. Um... Maybe I'm not live on Facebook. We might be having a little problem there on Facebook. It says live, so whatever. Uh, we will go now to uh, Gary Wayne. Let's see. I had him on before. This guy was so interesting. He had so much to talk about. My head nearly exploded. There was so much information. He, he wrote a book, and I would I will have the links. for. They might even be there on the Paranormal and all that right now, but... Anywhere you find the show, you're going to see the link to the Amazon page to get his book. It's uh, called, and I, it's a big book. Check it out. You can take all year to read it if you want. Dive in it, right into it and just, you know, whatever. Uh, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and Their Descendants, The Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. Uh, very, very interesting. And this comes from, I, I suppose, a Christian point of view, although um, he may say otherwise, I'm not sure. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit, but I am going to hit him with a question right off the bat, because we are going to talk about secret societies today and Freemasonry to start off. Where it goes from there, who knows? Uh, but uh, anyways, Gary Wayne, are you there? I'm here and so excited to be back on your show and really looking forward to the conversation today. Oh, definitely. I Like I said, you, you probably heard me just say my head nearly exploded last time we talked. There was so, <laughs> so much information. I'm just like, I was overwhelmed. I'm like, I mean, very, very interesting stuff, but uh, a, a lot, a lot of stuff. So um, thank well, you for coming. Hopefully we can provide another night of, uh, of a lot of information because <laughs> I think that's what people really like to get when they listen into the shows is not filler, but let's get down to the nitty gritty. The, nitty-gritty of it yeah oh heck yeah and um i mean there's so many things that uh we don't know and like i said you, you really did a lot of research into um uh writing this book and that's why it's i don't know how many pages is it it's 800 pages yep. um 120 pages of end notes and what you know, I, I don't normally tell people is, is i took out 350 pages because <laughs> it was just too big to get published so yeah Wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyways, I mean, yeah, so a big book, but like I said, man, you, this is a book you can keep on the coffee table, just keep diving into it. It may take you a year, may take you a week to read, who knows? I mean, I, I'm not that fast of a reader, and I usually go back and forth on it, but um, anyways, let's dive right into it. How about that? Uh, sure. Secret societies. Um I, when I think of secret societies, uh, they're not so secret because we know all the names right now, or most of them. Uh, but Freemasonry is one of the, the the biggest known of all of them, I would think. Um, and 
so my question to you to start this all off is what your thoughts are on Freemasonry and how this uh, reflects in your book. And a, a good question I wanted to throw out there because I've been digging a little bit and I, I, I won't, I can say I know some Freemasons and stuff like that, but I, I'm being told that Freemasonry uh, came from, it's so old, it, it came from a different race of beings and was brought here to our planet. And I'm very curious on what you think about that. Well, and that, that's a really, really, really good point. And, you know, to answer the question for the audience about what you posed just a little bit earlier so they better understand how I'm going to approach this is that I do come uh, by this whole subject from a Christian bias. Uh, but I've done a lot of research, obviously, outside the Bible and into secret societies and into areas I never thought I would get into. So when somebody says to me, just like what you just asked, is that, you know, did Freemasonry and their knowledge come from another planet? There's a couple different sort of ways you can understand that. Either it's an ancient alien technology in knowledge, uh, which is a very, very strong view uh, and maybe an interdimensional perspective, or it is, from my perspective, more likely, possibly from other planets, at least that's what the fairy mythology would classify the Genesis account in terms of fallen angels and the proud angel. Uh, you know, rebelling and coming to the earth uh, and creating a race of earthborn uh, fairies, known as the Tuatha of Danon, and as we would know as the Nephilim. But in the biblical account, um, this is a, a, a race that is distinct from humans, and it is greater than what an average sort of alien sort of perspective would be on it. The difference between the two perspectives are is, is how much greater in technology and how much greater in evolution or in how far they're evolved or their state of being are they. And what I'm referring to are, you know, a higher level than aliens as being in gods or fallen angels. And I do understand that the other perspective says, well, we, they just looked at them as gods. So, but we're going to come from that point of view and talk about a lot of different things. It's just that I... I, I look through a little bit different lens. And so what I learned is that Freemasonry takes uh, their history back to Genesis 6, essentially. Okay. And actually a little bit before. Uh, and so it, it has its own writings, and, you know, they have an expanded version of the Bible, and they have the Polychronicon, and they have their own history. And Albert Mackey, who is an adept out of the 1800s and one of the great patriarchs and writers along with Albert Pike uh, wrote extensively on this and, and collected their history and their legends into one book. And it's absolutely fascinating reading it. So he'll take their organization back to Cain and his son Enoch. And for people that maybe aren't familiar with the Bible, there are two Enochs. There's Enoch, son of Cain, and there's Enoch, son of Jared, that's about the sixth generation. So two different people that, that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I'm very, very, what I'm, what I'm saying is with what, you know, the question that you pose is, is that in itself, uh, the idea that the knowledge has come from God to Adam being passed on to Cain, and then Abel, Abel dies, and then on to Seth, and, and is utilized on the earth, and then they match up with the giants in partnership in the sixth generation to control the earth and utilize this knowledge and information uh, because by that time, the development through Cain and his progeny have developed mysticism and secret societies. So Freemasonry actually in their own writings will say their first they'll say Cain, but they look more on Enoch as the one who really developed the, the seven sacred sciences and the additional knowledge from the seven watchers that were provided to them. Uh, biblical people might know that more as the illicit knowledge from heaven, but this creates the mystical Eastern religion, which is so popular as sort of the belief system in science fiction of aliens, which I don't think is a coincidence. And secondly, 
Uh, they develop secret societies and mystery schools to continue to develop this knowledge to a great level that it probably developed to a level greater than what we have today. And the reason why I say that is, is again, from a biblical perspective, is, is the end time, which Christians believe in. When Jesus comes back for the second time, he says, that time of my second coming is going to be like the days of Noah. So if our technology is this far advanced and we're not in the end time yet, then that means that the technology that is developed by Freemasonry, the seven sacred sciences, and through the mystery schools and the mystery religions that come partly from elsewhere was developed to a level that's higher than what we have today. That's a bit of a mouthful to get this, the show going, but I think it should spark some questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's um, that's uh, certainly a lot to take in. Um, but uh, so, so um, it, it came from the heavens then, uh, and, yes. and seeded itself into uh, society on, on, in, or on Earth or here. Yeah, yeah, and... This knowledge that they protect and what they study and what they worship even today within Freemasonry, mm -hmm. you know, was developed, like I say, to a very, very high level. And uh, if people are wondering what those seven sacred sciences are, I mean, the names are pretty mundane, but it's really what they did with that technology once they got it rolling. So, you know, basic things like grammar and rhetoric and dialectics and arithmetic and geometry, which incidentally inside the craft of Freemasonry, they call uh, geometry, the fifth science, as known as alternatively as masonry, mm -hmm. plus music and astronomy. And what they did was is they combined the first three, grammar, rhetoric, and dialectics, to create another super sort of science that is very, very important to their belief system and the development of the knowledge that's called philosophy, which you'd be familiar with in university or through the, or the Greeks, because, again, this stuff came down through the, uh, the, the mystery schools. And mm -hmm. philosophy, they believe, is superior to the seven sciences because it's the arbitrator between the sciences, and it unites them all together, leading them to uh, the philosophy of what they call the absolute or the supreme ideal as you get into Rosicrucianism, which is higher than Freemasonry. And it's kind of what they would say is the Unitarian conception of the development of this knowledge. And this knowledge is also used to help them to hopefully, from their perspective, evolve into gods. It's one of the key things is the development of Gnosis or, or the Gnostic religion, as they would call it. And also, they believe it to help the development of humanity through the sciences to, you know, achieve the perfect ethical spirit from their religious perspective, freeing their dependence from God, because obviously they're adversaries of the God of the Bible. And alchemy is a byproduct of this absolute science, and taken to its ultimate level, it will do. It has two capabilities: one of destroying the world multiple times over and also will enable this new golden age that they're, they're looking to take us into. So, and this is all from their writings. I'm not mm -hmm. taking this aspect out of uh, anything that's uh, religious or anything. This is what they say within their own religion and in, in their own temples and their own cult. So, so their main um, objective uh, is what? Well, their main objective is very, very similar to um, what uh, the uh, the leaders of, I guess, I guess you would have to back up a step and look at it this way and just say, look, they answer to a higher level of being, which would be the, uh, the fallen angels, and uh, the demons would be working with them. And so they're in a state of rebellion against the God of the Bible, whom they look at as absolutely evil. And so they're looking to uh, have a rendezvous with destiny or a uh, showdown to win their freedom uh, and to live in their own realm, just as it says they want to do it in the fairy mythology as well. And so they know they can't, um, well, the humans don't know this, but the, the angels know they can't defeat uh, the omnipotent uh, God, but they're hoping that he will... Uh, give them a separate realm to live with on their own. And so you see that reflected in science fiction, whether it's, whether it's right. in Star Wars or, 
any uh, any of the other science fiction ones. Is, is there's always these two great forces. That's the dualism of the Freemasonic religion, uh, where you have good and evil that are in constant push back and forth and in balance. And so they teach, even though they know differently, but they'll teach down through the secret societies that. Um, Lucifer, who is their god, or the great architect of the universe, as they're also known, is the equal of Adonai that they call the god of the Bible. So they recognize that Adonai is god, but so is Lucifer, but neither one can win, and they're in this continual fight that they tell humans that because of that, you have an ability to win... uh, your own freedom and live in a realm that's free from this oppressive God. Because they look at the God of the uh, of the universe as causing the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying them and a whole bunch of other things that they like to like to roll out. Uh, and from a polytheist perspective, I get that. I, I just don't come from a polytheist perspective. Mm-hmm. So when you look at Star Wars as an analogy of that, so you have this mystical religion that we're talking about, right? right, right. And, uh, and you also have this... Uh, good force and evil force, right? That's the life force of the universe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's above Adonai and Lucifer and how they look at things. And you have this constant battle going back and forth. And the in the allegory that's turned inside out from a Christian perspective, you have the, uh, the empire, which is this evil empire, which would be the allegory for God and his angels. And then you have the rebels fighting for their own uh, freedom against this very powerful... Um, empire that's uh, trying to enslave the rest of the galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. And so they look at the god of the universe enslaving humans uh, in the physical world and not permitting them to evolve into godhood. Wow, okay, so the the Freemasons uh, are looking to overthrow uh, God and get the god of the universe from the Bible to, to earn their freedom? Uh, yes, and to hmm. evolve into gods. Okay, okay. So every so, free, when, so every Freemason so when, on the planet right now, uh, that's what they believe then, huh? Yeah, huh. yeah, and and they believe that they need to enter in this new age or this new utopia to, to make this happen. So when <clears throat> Francis Bacon, who is a Rosicrucian mm-hmm. and inspirational founder to the Royal Society, which again develops the seven sacred sciences, the lead people away from God, and to also uh, honor the great architect of the universe, who is Lucifer. Mm -hmm. He writes a book that is the inspiration for the founding of the Royal Society, and that book is called The New Atlantis. And The New Atlantis is is about this uh, age that we're talking about, a new golden age, the golden age before the flood. That's why Atlantis is so... Uh, so, such an important allegory to them. But it's an age that is going to be ruled over um, by a combination of science that works in harmony with a religion, but their religion, so a polytheist religion. And uh, a utopia, as they would call it, that is uh, free from the uh, enslavement of, of monotheism. So when he talks about the New Age and he's referring to Atlantis, they're mm-hmm. trying to recreate what they once had in the antediluvian epoch, with Atlantis being the allegory that they're using. And what's interesting about that is that Atlantis was more than just the, the island continent, as most people understand it. As you get into Plato um, in Timaeus and Critias, he is talking about actually 10 pieces of this empire. So it was a 10-nation empire, and they were looking for world domination or world government, but they get checked by the ancient uh, Greeks out of Athens, uh, whom Hercules would have fought against the Atlanteans in the Greek tradition. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't happen. But the key thing is is that it has ten empires, which is the ten empires that uh, is predicted in Daniel and in Revelation, the ten kings of the end times. And what's also interesting as we talk about secret societies is as they're looking about what they're trying to bring up about, there was a group that either answers to the Rosicrucians or one step higher to the committee of, of three or the Council of Three Hundred. Um, mm-hmm. and that's called the Club of Rome. And in nineteen sixty eight, it's the Committee of Three Hundred, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and they were created in 1968 to cattle herd uh, humankind into world government. And what they did was they divided the world up into 10 trading blocks or 10 groups of nations, 10 spheres of influences, 10 empires, however you want to call it, that they're still working on bringing about today. So even though there's some things that are going a little bit off the rails, uh, like the Brexit thing and perhaps maybe President Trump with what he's, he's doing, they're still trying to create these economic groups for this 10-nation empire, this new Atlantis that's going to establish globalism because what's so important to them is that they need the world to come together under this one religion and this one government so that they can have the spark of the divine, as they call it, which is the seed or the DNA or the gene of Isis of the Nephilim to come together so that they can have a harmonic convergence that they like to talk about in New Age. Mm -hmm. um, so that they can advance to the next level or vibrate to the next level of, uh, of state of being, so into godhood. And so they believe they need to be able to collect all of that under that one sort of government and universal religion. So just to give you a quick sort of idea where some of that religion of what they believe in and what their societies are trying to do, because there's more than just the Freemasonry Society when we're talking about secret societies. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And um, I mean, but this all, they all came together, you said, 1968? No, that's the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome, right. Um, yeah. And, and why is it new, why are they going to call it, why does it have to be the new Atlantis? Why, why do they have to come together to build this to get the world to unite? Um, I mean, it just seems like, you know, starting from scratch is just going to be, unless it's something so overwhelming that it will catch the attention of the people, uh, it, it's so hard to believe that they're going to be able to uh, accomplish that. Yeah, it, it, it is very difficult to accomplish it. I mean, world government is difficult in itself, let alone a world religion that is going to be accepted by all of the other religions. So, I mean, you're going to have to have some sort of universal religion, but that's what they're, that is what they're indeed trying to bring about to establish that new golden age, right? To permit humanity or, uh, as you get higher up the actually descendants of the Nephilim and the, and the fallen angels, um, the, the hybrid beings that w are the ones that are actually going to evolve, not the mundane humans. So it's, it's a very, very difficult thing, and it's been tried to be done over time, but it's, and generally through war. Okay. But it's too, it's too difficult to do it through war because... So it keeps failing. They, yeah, I mean, so whether it's the, uh, the, you know, National Socialism out of World War II, or you go back to Napoleon, or several of these other Antichrist figures who are trying to do the same thing with their occultic polytheist religion... Um, it's just too difficult to do. So how it's predicted to happen in the Bible is is that this is put in place first for Antichrist to come to power, not Antichrist to come up and then try and do it through war. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say um, uh, they're doing something wrong maybe. I mean, I, I also, <laughs> also curious why uh, Lucifer is uh, put on such a high pedestal. And uh, I mean, that's just very intriguing in itself. Well, he is accredited with um, being a good angel. He's uh, uh, accredited with being the bringer of knowledge to humankind. He's accredited with uh, trying to help humankind and looking after their cause and trying to help them win their freedom from the oppressive God of the Bible. And so they totally take uh, Lucifer from a Satan perspective, as a Christian would call it, and they would raise him to this great God of knowledge and light. And that's why Freemasonry calls themselves the children of light, because light is the allegory for the knowledge and the learning that they receive through initiation, so that when you become an adept, either at third degree York Rite or 33rd degree Scottish Rite, you become enlightened or illuminated and at that level you become illuminati which is all sort of the same sort of word in an allegory mm -hmm. and so the illuminati is is you know sits at the inner circle of freemasonry although the illuminati still reports to the rosicrucians huh um and, and why did they end up being 
known as a secret society and not a religion? Why did the name, you know, from the very beginning, not start off as a, a religion in itself and turn into this whole secret thing and secret society? Well, two different avenues. So if you think about um, the, the organizational structure in ancient times, and so you have the, uh, the Nephilim, powerful king, uh, who creates these dynasties uh, before and after the flood, mm-hmm. the royal families, as you would know them, coming down history. And you also have uh, this great religion that is set beside them, and then they have the various gods that they would worship, which would be one of the watchers. Uh, now, they all have different vernacular names, but it's all talking about the same sort of hierarchical st- uh, structure. Mm-hmm. So, within the religious aspect, it actually has a very powerful influence over what everything's going to do in in that realm or in that kingdom. And so you have the religious aspect with the worshipping of the god, and you have uh, the rituals and things like that, but you also they develop the mystery schools alongside of it that they're going to develop the knowledge. And this is, again, that sort of core architecture that happens throughout ancient history. But as you have the dawn of Christianity, Mm -hmm. and you have the Roman Church that is purging the Gnostic religions, whether or not it's the Manichaeans, or uh, Mithraism, or Zoroastrianism, or the plethora of different uh, vernacular names to the polytheist religions within the Roman Empire, they have to go underground, and sometimes they're underground within the church, uh, and outside the church they start to form secret societies. So the first major secret society that you you know you really become familiar with is formed in 1099, which is the Templars, which is formed by uh, uh, Mason adepts uh, and sons of princes out of uh, Europe who are going to combine with other groups like the Essenes and the Basilians and the Alexandria Mystery Schools, the Johannites, the Sabaeans and the Mandaeans and the Essenes and a few other groups. They're going to form this greater sort of occult society, and they're also going to form a partnership with uh, Sufism, which is another part of mysticism as well that comes out of Arabia, um, and with the assassins in particular, and actually work with the assassins for a hundred years or so. And that's the organizational structure coming out of the assassins with that initial starting up of the Templars that will get passed down to these other secret societies that develop uh, about four or five hundred years later. And so a quick study on that is is in 1307, the Templars are destroyed by the French king and um, uh, the Roman church and is, are disbanded. And so what they're going to do after this is, is they're not going to leave everything centralized into one organization, right, right. Uh, where, which the Templars did. And, I mean, they were very, very powerful. And so they, you know, they develop, uh, you know, the Rothschilds in the 1700s to replace the banking arm of Freemasonry. You know, they create the Royal Society in 1660 uh, to get control of the education and the and develop the sciences, and they actually call that um, the, the sort of crossroads between the last of the sorcerers and the, the first of the scientists, because they were all Rosicrucians and Freemasons who formed the Royal Society, and they and they do that to get control of the education. They, they develop the Jesuits in the 1500s as well to replace what the Templars were doing um, within Christianity and to be at the cutting edge of what they want to do in terms of going to the New World and how they're going to prepare the Church for the end time. And there are still Benedictines and Cistercians and Augustines who are these moles that were in there before, but they need an organization that is more free based on what happened with their involvement with the Templars to to do uh, the work inside of the Roman Church. And you have the Illuminati being formed in about the 1500s, and their goal is to uh, work on world government and to destroy Christianity uh, as a whole. Hmm. And Rosicrucianism actually starts a little bit sooner at 1188, at the cutting of the elms, where they split off from the Templars because they look at what the Templars have done, they've lost their way and lost their agenda from what they originally were formed to do in 1099. So they actually begin 
uh, organizing the secret societies after about 1188 at the cutting of the elms. And then also you have the Freemasonry, Freemasonic groups starting up after 1307, almost immediately thereafter, um, when some of the refugee Templars go to Scotland and are protected by the St. Clair family. And the St. Clair family um, also is known as the St. Clairs and as one of the uh, originally originating founders of the Knights Templar and Grand Masters of the Priory of Sion. Several of them were Grand Masters as well. They actually changed the name from Templarism to Freemasonry, um, and it's known as Freemasonry or French Masonry, and they picked Freemasonry for obvious reasons uh, as they move into England a little bit later down the road. So all of these organizations are set up to replace the Templars. So that's kind of the main organizational group uh, coming out of uh, the Middle Ages, but with the Rosicrucians Mm -hmm. being more important. And they actually have about 50% membership of pure bloods, where the other ones underneath are more or less um, less pure blood and maybe super talented. So if you want to look at a hierarchy going up, even though there's a whole bunch of other branches sort of underneath, you've got Freemasonry, which is bringing in people to initiate them into the mysteries and take them to the third degree in the old standard, but there's four, five, six, seven, not to be confused with the Scottish right, because that just breaks the third, the three degrees down into, you know, different subgroups, right? right. Uh, but it's still a third degree. And so you go from a depth level uh, Freemasonry into Illuminati, and then the most pure blood and the talent of the Illuminati go into the Rosicrucians, and then they associate with the pure bloods who have their own initiation in-house from their own families. Huh. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a, a lot to take into. Uh, so, so basically... Um... Uh, everything sp- it sounds like to me everything spawned off of Freemasonry from the start, and, and they use they use the religions and stuff and created them to uh, to, to implement their what they wanted to do their agenda, right? Yeah, absolutely, they did, okay. and uh, they looked at um, how, you know getting control is two things: one is knowledge, and the other one is power, and that's why you know they're they're always after more and more power and more more control. So that's why they have to partner. That's why they partnered with uh, the kings and the and the giants in, in the old days. And that's mm-hmm. why they're still trying to have control of the royal families, mm-hmm. that's the bloodlines, uh, and uh, world leaders even to this day. Okay. And how about like uh, other groups like uh, the Knights of Pythias and Odd Fellows, just uh, all, all offshoots of. Um... Uh, the same yeah. type of thing. Yeah, you've got. Yeah, and you've still got you know a number of those that are even still within the Catholic Church. Whether it's like it's the Knights of Malta, which is you know very very powerful mm-hmm. with uh, politicians in England and, and other places, and you know the Pope's just moved to uh, take that over. And the Knights of Saint John. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are all initiatory orders that are um, sort of were sister organizations um, of, of of Templarism, and mm-hmm. they still keep that sort of. Uh, uh, Sort of hereditary uh, order, but they still have their own specific sort of mini agendas that's all working directionally for the same cause. So, that, you know, the three biggest groups that were around and formed at about the same time were uh, the Templars, were the other, and the Templars bore the the Red Cross, and then you had the mm-hmm. White Cross, which was the Knights of St. John or the Knights of, of Malta or the Knights of Rhodes, and then you have the Teutonic Knights, and they were the Black Cross. Okay. The Teutonic Knights. I never heard of that group. Um, they're still around that's, then. That's German, and that had a very large influence uh, on Nazi Germany. And yes, they're still around. Okay. Um, not in the same sort of powerful fashion that they were at one time, but they literally were in control of Germany at, at one point in time in history. Uh, hmm. um, and so the SS out of the Nazis, for example, were, were based on um, the Teutonic Knights. The mo- you know, the modern sort of version. And, and pretty much a, a spinoff of uh, Freemasonry, right? Absolutely. I okay. mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the rise of uh, National Socialism, it comes through this polytheist religion, and it comes through the secret groups of the secret societies. So, 
Um, the Rosicrucians, they're the ones who were housing and protecting this uh, cosmology of Gnostic religions, so a combination of the world polytheist religions. And so they spawn a new religion in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, called Theosophy that Helen Belaski is um, uh, funded to, to uh, set up that's an offshoot of Gnosticism, just as the New Age religion is an offshoot of theosophy. So it's basically the, it's the same religion coming through. Mm -hmm. And so that takes on uh, what they call in National Socialism, not theosophy. They, it kind of goes rogue on it a little bit. They actually call it Ariosophy, and they start to overlay a Teutonic, an ancient Teutonic, uh, an Arian, uh, Thule, which is another uh, mythology that's similar to Atlantis, uh, ideology onto theosophy and so it has takes sort of a, a pan-arian type of occultic ideology and they overlay also volkish id ideology on that as well and so that's the beginning of the start of national socialism and in the early 1900s you have the start of the armanen order by von list and uh, you know he's a wealthy german nationalist of indo-arian teutonic um belief system, um, trying to re reincarnate sort of the empires of old, and uh, he's, he's combining this with uh, uh, Volkish and uh, Vril ideology, which is a, Vril is a, a blood ideology out of the Rosicrucians with occultic religions and the Illuminati agenda. And then you have another group that starts up in about 1907, that's called the New Temple or Order by Jorgen uh, Lands von Liebenfeld, hmm. and uh, he's actually a Cistercian monk, which is again one of the people that found the uh, uh, leading groups that found uh, the Templars, because that's the Gnostics mold into uh, the Cistercian and the Benedictine orders in the in the Roman Catholic Church. Quite hmm. quite years, quite quite a number of years before, obviously, but it's the same belief system, right? And hmm. then in 1912, you got von List and. He combines that with the uh, New Temple Order and the Armanen together to form the Ger Germanen Order, which has uh, a distinct now Ariosophy, as they start to call it, religion, and they start to uh, take in Ve uh, Wagner as sort of their uh, musician of choice in some of the plays and things, which again has some real ideology in it. You know, by 1980, you have the Thule Society that's formed by. Uh, Schettendorf, as I call, and that's the Munich Lodge. And then the Thule Society, later in that year, it starts the DAP, which is the German Worker Party uh, that uh, Hitler joins in 1919. And then the Thule Society, it buys the uh, Volkisch uh, uh, newspaper called Fokker, which probably nobody will remember and it's hard to pronounce. Hmm. And it has uh, Elkhart as its, editor, as its uh, editor, and he... Uh, he is the one who mentors Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. And then by the mid-20s, you have the Hitler Youth Movement, which, again, is another secret society, and you've got the SS being formed. And by 1933, you have Bergman forming the, the Reich Church, um, which is a distinctly uh, area, uh, area Ariosophy religion mm -hmm. or an Aryan religion that uh, is that starts to separate from... Um, uh, the Roman Church and Christianity. So, but the big thing to remember is all of these orders and groups. These are Masonic orders and groups that are forming this, and you see this religious aspect that's all part of it, right? Yeah. And of course, Hitler. Um, this the idea of Arianism goes back to Thule, where they believe that that was the age ruled by giants, and that their race descends out of these giants. And of course, they have uh, the idea ideology that. It's blonde-haired and blue-eyed Aryans, right, which was one of the skin, uh, the hair color and eye color of some of the, the Nephilim. The other one was red hair and green eyes, which is more towards Tuatha Danan. And you had these two segments, this North, Norse ideology and this Celtic ideology, but they take theirs back to the blonde-haired and blue-eyed sort of theology out of, uh, out of the Antediluvian Epoch. Wow. Well, but they... Um... They really, okay, and a lot of people are going to hate me, for, well, not hate me, but, but hate the concept of this, but 
Freemasonry really during that World War Two, World War One era with uh, Hitler, really this was a, a something they tried to put together and, and, and really, you know, get an Aryan race, a pure race on this planet uh, to pretty much. Yeah, they, con- they, they call that the new man concept, which is a Nephilim concept concept and they're trying to do it through uh, eugenics and genetics right mm-hmm. um, and they believe it within the real ideology out of Rosicrucianism that there's something in the blood aka bloodlines mm-hmm. that if they could backwards engineer somehow they could recreate uh, the giants and the demigods of old huh. and for some reason they think that that will be uh, better for this planet because I mean it didn't work then. I mean, what what makes them think that uh, bringing that pure blood or that pure, you know, the giants back or, or the Nephilim? Well, they they remember the Antediluvian Age as being a golden age and that it was destroyed by and they believe it was destroyed by God of the Bible because hmm. mankind was advancing too far. Okay. And he wanted to take them back into complete ignorance and poverty so that they would, you know, have to, they would be enslaved and be forced, forced to worship God. That's the other side of the belief system on what prehistory is all about. Okay, it so. was either, okay. And you don't get any of that in the Bible. You have to go elsewhere. But it doesn't matter whether you, you, mm-hmm. you read about it in, in, in Freemasonry, which they have lots of writing on that, or you go into Greek mythology, or you go into Sumerian mythology with the Anunnaki, or you go into the Kishimaya, or you go into uh, the subcontinent of Indian uh, ancient history and religion, or, or, or China. It's the same story yeah. all around the world. So, right? I mean, they're, they're basically trying to... They're, it's your main goal, really, just is trying to overthrow the, the God of the Bible and... and be free right i mean so that basically is what it comes down to and whatever they can yeah. do to get to that point they're going to do right good or evil <laughs> yes yeah see that's the part that gets to me i mean all, all the evil in the world uh you know it, it doesn't matter to them because uh, they want to get to their end goal and to uh do the evil deeds that they do to get to that point just um uh, you know, it's just kind of unthinkable and, you know, most people actually shrug it off and go, this is a bunch of BS. I don't believe it. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we see it every day. I mean, we do see the, you know, but, but most people can turn a blind eye to it. I just, it's just hard to believe, um, that that's what goes on. But, uh, and, and, and there's stuff that goes on right now. Like, you know, that, I, I mean, we won't go into it, but the whole, the whole yeah. pizza gate thing yeah. and, the whole, yep. you know, yep. all this very disturbing stuff that yep. when we talk about it, it's got to be controlled in some way by uh, the elite who I would think yep. is still being controlled by the Freemasons, right? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even when you go back to what we we're just talking about, these societies and what's going on in Nazi Germany mm-hmm. is they are funded by um, the banks. They were funded by the banks, uh, by the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers um, and uh, the Warburgs and uh, on and on and on with this, this sort of cabal of bankers to put. And, and they met Hitler in London uh, and they funneled the money through the BIS bank and uh, one other bank. Uh, doesn't really matter that the money went through uh, so that they could um, offset had transpired over in Russia with communism. So communism was also funded by them in, in a similar manner, and it went rogue. And so now they're creating the National Socialism Movement to offset what they set up with communism. But then again, Hitler goes rogue again, and he starts to look at himself as a uh, messiah-type figure with his new religion, and he's going to set up uh, the Third Reich, which is uh, an ideology of a rule of a thousand years again, which is that golden age. So you see the consistency and the pattern when we talk about what they're trying to do for the end time. Um, only this time they won't do it by war. They'll just have the platform set up for Antichrist. Yeah. Hmm. So they, a lot of times, like Hitler, uh, they tend to not listen. They start off with their agenda. They get the person they want to try to lead and, and conquer, but 
ends up going off and not working. So they keep trying and trying and trying. Um, do you think yep. that uh, they will ever get to the end of days? I mean, do you believe they will actually reach that goal? Yes, um, but they won't get it until what they call in the Bible the restrainer is removed. So the spirit of the Antichrist is always in play. And that's why you have Antichrist figures rising over time and so whether or not you want to consider from a Christian perspective from that view that Hitler would be an Antichrist figure or Nostradamus, who is a Rosicrucian, as Hitler being the second Antichrist and Napoleon being the one before that. And, of course, he sets up a similar sort of thing that Hitler's trying to do. And the, the parallels are just uh, spectacular. And you go back into history, there's also like Alexander the Great would be considered another Antichrist figure. But it can't happen until the restrainer and the ordained time takes place. And again, this ideology of usurping um, control illegally is another concept to keep an eye on, just as Napoleon took over the French Revolution mm -hmm. from the triumvirs, right, right. And, and became a dictator. Hitler takes over Germany illegally. He seizes control mm -hmm. and becomes dictator and uh, dismisses a, a democracy after that. The same thing will happen in the end time. Even though they're going to help uh, bring Antichrist to power. He turns on them. He'll overthrow three of those ten empires, and he'll destroy Babylon, the mystery religion, and replace it with his own religion. Uh, and he will also slaughter all of the the, the liberals from the the, the the secret societies en masse, because now they're in his way. They're going to stand against him because he's turned against them. Mm -hmm. So not only will Antichrist slaughter people following God, he'll slaughter anybody standing in his way, and even yeah. people who help get him there. Huh. So is there, is there anywhere, uh, does it say who that last Antichrist is going to be? Or, or is this something that keeps, uh, that isn't laid out in front of us and keeps failing, and just one day uh, we're going to hit that right uh, person who's going to accomplish what they want? I mean, is this already uh, well, laid out, it, or no? It, it can't happen until the ordained times. Uh, that's that's quite clear from a Christian perspective. From the other side, is they've got three Antichrist figures um, initiated and ready to go all of the time and in hiding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So they're always trying to bring it about. They're just unable to do it. And it's difficult. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the world is actually going to say we're going to have one government and uh, we're going to have one religion. So it's going to take some significant changes or catastrophes or revelations, a.k.a. Uh, uh, an encounter with the aliens where they, what do they call it, is that the fourth or the fifth kind? I can't remember. They introduce themselves and we find out that we're not alone in the universe. Mm -hmm. And again, in science fiction, what they like to write about this in terms of that allegory um, is, is what happens then is the world comes together, right? One government over and over and over right well that's why I, i'm that's why i'm uh baffled by why it hasn't happened yet i mean if if uh i mean because people do talk about the aliens as yes. uh, there is a council that you know actually governs over the planet and yep. again the masters are known by uh about 20 or 30 different names yeah and, and why they can't implement this one world order that they want to uh you know, accomplish. I, I just, why is it so hard for them? Is it just that we, well, we as human beings are just way too complicated and it's, it's not uh, yeah. that easy to reel us in? No, they're, they're, I mean, I think they're waiting for us to, you know, from their perspective, um, they're waiting for humankind to advance the technology and uh, uh, maybe hmm. in thought process a little bit more when, when they're doing it, when, uh, I think when they think that we're going to be ready. Um, but again, I mean, hmm. that also sort of runs against what I was saying earlier in terms of, you know, if they could get world government now that they would. But I think they need a, tech, a technologically savvy people who are prepared to accept the concept uh, that we're not alone in the universe. Again, right? then, though, why, why don't they help uh, push it along then? I mean... They have got they to be way advanced than we are. Go ahead. I think uh, 
they, they haven't seen us advance enough yet in technology to bring that about. Okay. Hmm. Well. And, and, and again, I'm just looking at, I'm not uh, an alien expert. I'm just no, no, looking right, at right. it from the secret society perspective and what I do know about uh, the, the alien sort of genre. Oh, exactly. Um, and, there's, and there's parallels on this too that comes out of prehistory as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, from an alien perspective is in that mythos will basically say that um, the planet was started by um, extraterrestrials and they've been here ever since and they've been watching us ever since, which sort of goes to that watcher concept of, of the angels. But yeah. where I'm going more specifically with this, so there's different classifications in here as there is in the uh, alien mythos. So you've got reptilians and you've got little people and uh, you've got more powerful beings and other races as all of that sort of comes together in, in that mythos. But if you match that up now with what uh, polytheism has to say about prehistory, and you'll find some parallels uh, that you can bring across from a Christian perspective, but um, you have to really be prepared to listen to understand this. Um, they, The polytheists um, believe that there were more beings created than just the giants in addition to humankind, that in that age there was lots of other beings. And you see that coming through in the allegories uh, for narratives that we see through history, whether it's in Midsummer's Night Dream and Shakespeare. they got uh, all sorts of different beings, and more recently would be in The Lord of the Rings, right? So you've got right. hobbits, and you've got uh, elves, and you've got dwarves. And, and so these are other beings that are the greater Nephilim concept of creation, of the corruption of the laws of creation that are going on in the antediluvian epoch. And uh, it's thought either through copulation and or uh, the advancement of the technologies to do DNA uh, manipulation. So uh, little people is um, a mythos that runs alongside the flood it runs parallel with the giants. Hmm. It runs parallel with the pyramids. It's part of this greater sort of mythos that's in every culture on all continents uh, that's unaccounted for, right. uh, that lived in, at, at the same time as all of these other events and peoples. And within the fairy concept, you've got four classifications of fairies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you've got the fairies that I've talked about that are led by the proud angel that I talked about earlier that are the uh, fallen angels or, or gods. Uh, then you have the earthborn fairies, uh, which are the Titans or the Anunnaki or the Detria or the Madios or Miatos, I mean, in China. Um, but they are the same types of beings because they're created the same way. Um, and those, these are the giants. And then you have the daemons or the demons, and these are the bodiless spirits of the demigods uh, after their bodies die out. Mm -hmm. And so, again, translating that through to Christianity, so you have fallen angels and you have the demons. Uh, and then you have the fourth class, which is um, the elementals. And the elementals have three subgroups. So you've got uh, the gnome classification, and you've got the mischievous classification, mm -hmm. and then you also have the uh, uh, the little ones or the pretty ones. And um, so the mischievous ones would be like leprechauns, right? And again, okay. this is the same constant separation of subgroups of, of the elementals all around the earth. And then in the gnome classification, these are the ones who keep the knowledge, the genealogies. But within one group, there is a group uh, that comes down through the ages called the Grey Neighbors or the Greys. And mm -hmm. these have flying machines, and they kidnap people uh, for a fortnight, and they do experimentation on them, sexual uh, DNA. Uh, people get returned with, um, without a memory and only can recall it under hypnosis. Uh, very advanced people. Uh, and... I put one of those accounts in my book that if you didn't know I was talking about a fairy abduction, you'd hmm. swear it was a great alien abduction. And so these are also known as beings that were created or reprobate beings or demon-spirited beings. Hmm. So the greys definitely are not from another uh, solar system, uh, different race. They're, they're demons from this planet. Yes, they were created in, in prehistory and somehow survived the flood with their technology, whether mm -hmm. it's through...
because again, in fairy mythology, just as an alien mythology, portal is a significant um, uh, sort of doctrine, right? That you mm-hmm. you enter through portals either on, under the water or from another dimension, and the same ideology is there in fairy mythology, and so you also have these great little mini megaliths around the world, um, mini Stonehenge-like buildings, and they're called fairy dolmens, and dolmen means portal. And so a shay in fairy mythology or a fairy mound is also thought to be a portal. Um, And just as you get into the allegory of the ladies of the lake in King Arthur, um, they're guarding the portals uh, because, again, in fairy mythology, you have female fairies that are also guardians uh, of the gateways to the other world, which would be Tartarus or Anwin or the other world or uh, in in Peter Pan, which it's, uh, what is it, Uh, not uh, Neverland. Mm -hmm. It's all the same sort of allegory going into these other portals. And so there's this strong ideology or understanding out there that these other types of beings survived, and these are the aliens that, that we're seeing. And so from how we look at it, coming at it from a Christianity perspective, is, is we don't necessarily discount that there's the alien phenomena. Mm-hmm. It's just what is that understanding? Do they actually come from other planets, or is this still part of that whole prehistory that nobody really understands? Yeah, that's the exciting part to me when I dive into this. I mean, uh, the fairy folk and like the gnomes and leprechauns. I mean, the, these uh, do have existed in that form that we know them as. And uh, do they still appear um, to this day? Or are, are those like, let's just say gnomes. Are, are they, yeah. do, do they still appear now, you know, in the 20th century, the 21st century? Yeah. So if you get into um, Native Americans and, and, they're very, very strong on the little people. They still see, say that the little people exist. And if you get into places like Scotland and Ireland, mm-hmm. they still believe, and they still believe that there's sightings, right? Yeah. So, but I think that changes, right? I think that is now how we understand them as aliens. Hmm, okay. And we had, and, and our ancestors understood them as fairies in a way that made sense to them. But we understand with the understanding of technology and and how advanced these beings are that, you know, uh, they must be aliens or they come from the future or, you know, whatever reason, reason that you want to, to utilize on that. But they have a greater technology than what we have. Well, I like to think that there's little gnomes like living under the <laughs> ground in their tunnel systems and stuff like that. But that's just my well, little, little kid in me, my and, imagination. And, and again, this is, you know, some speculation on the fringe sort of Christianity part, but they, there's a belief that, uh, whether it's Nephilim and their associated uh, beings that they lived with, a lot of them uh, escaped the flood and the disasters that, that came with the flood by escaping into the ground because they had built underground cities, right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then the other concept is, is that the continents aren't quite the same as they were because when you have a conflagration of events, not just a flood event, uh, that's actually started by asteroids hitting the oceans, and you have Gulf volcanoes and um, the, the Earth's crust shifting. You, you have continents moving up and down, and that is why you have all of these underground cities that they're finding all around the world, because some of those advanced cities were above ground before the flood, but because you've got that, that whole crust thing just cracking open and, and, and repositioning, you've got mm-hmm. some of those antediluvian cities going into uh, into the... Uh, uh, into the ocean, and if you get into a lot of these megaliths, not megaliths, but ancient cities that are built, I mean, what's underground is is bigger than what's above ground, right? And mm-hmm. so there's there's something to that, or the the underground cities that's uh, talked about in Mexico, um, you know, that sort of under, understanding brings us this ideology, this idea together in terms of. Um, what happened in prehistory on how advanced people could survive, or they or they survived off world, right? If they had a technology in ships, they could have actually <laughs> rode out that mm-hmm. disaster in, in their ships if they actually had flying machines, which they probably did. Hmm. Interesting. So, so you kind of don't think that they? I mean, they probably showed themselves in forms of like the the red hat, the green, you know, the the leprechauns, you know, the way we see it. Um, do you think that was something totally separate, or do you think um, 
that's just the way they showed themselves to the people. Yeah, I think that's the way they showed themselves to the people. Um, and they're, they're always associated with magic. And to me, that's just another word for knowledge and uh, advanced technology, right? Yeah, um, okay. And so, like, even the pot at the end of the rainbow, that's just an allegory, <laughs> a fairy allegory. So, I mean, the yeah. rainbow is part of the flood allegory, right? Yeah. And the treasure at the end of the rainbow isn't really gold, it's uh, knowledge. And, right. again, everything is about knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we, we went whether off not of... It's, whether or not it's the pearls of wisdom or it's the archives of the Masons or... Yeah. Uh, you know, you name it, the Shatia, mm -hmm. uh, the Emerald Tablet, that's all the same allegory of this hidden knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say we went off of the secret societies a little bit, but um, I, I did want to talk about and get your uh, thoughts on the uh, the reptilians and what you uh, mm -hmm. what their role is and uh, what's going on here. Uh, I mean, I, I had a story, uh, I don't even know how I can add this story into what we're talking about, but I, I interviewed a woman who, uh, uh, actually the, the whole MK ultra thing and, and was, uh, you know, abducted eight months at a time, but pretty much uh, her whole life, she had dealt with this kind of, um, you know, mind control and, uh, you know, something that truly happened and went on and probably still goes on to this day. Um, uh, which came out through the church hearings too, and uh, I believe 1963 or 73, something like that. Uh, Project Paperclip, and um, but anyway, yep. she, she was. Uh, she told me she, when she was under uh, and had missing time for that eight month period, uh, she was in a, a room where sacrifices were going on and, and and whatnot, and she was pretty much a sexual slave for uh, what what was going on. And the two people she did recognize that, that was looking over everybody was a, a military man and um, mm -hmm. a reptilian uh, with, uh, with a cloak on. And uh, just very odd that, uh, you know, the reptilians are in on this and you would see the military too. But, uh, yeah. you know, so I, I'd like to get your thoughts on what the reptilians have to do with uh, the whole uh, secret societies or, mm -hmm. and, and what's going on. Yeah. So let me uh, come at this from uh, two different perspectives, because, again, um, it's not an unknown concept of reptilians in, um, uh, in sort of the Christian perspective, but, again, not sort of common Christian uh, doctrine. But right. uh, so when we look at the, uh, the Nephilim that were created from the fallen angels, uh, as the first classification is, is they're created by a group. Uh, that are known as Watchers, or the Gregorias are called in, um, in Greek. But these Watchers were a distinct order of angels. And these angels were known as Seraphim, um, as said in Isaiah 6, and taken back to Numbers 21 for understanding them as serpents, as fiery serpents. And so the Seraphim angels had the face of uh, a snake or a viper or a serpent, right? And you put these wings on them and you have an angelic looking dragon, right? And if that was like a flying snake in that sort of look, then you'd have a physical dragon uh, of mythology. And so this dragon mythology and the serpent uh, uh, mythology and this reptilian ideology sort of, uh, from my perspective, goes back to these gods or these aliens or um, but I think of them more as fallen angels and so the offspring that they produced the Nephilim uh, in the first generation they looked just like their fathers and so they had the face of a snake just as they had a little bit longer neck and as they're called after the flood Anakim and uh, Anak means long neck and they had long protruded chins and they had slanted eyes that glowed and they had high cheekbones and uh, uh, they had this absolutely this reptilian look and so if you look at gods around the earth as they're portrayed in prehistory in so many cases they're shown as snakes and uh, same with with some of the kings and just as you also have a feathered serpent uh, coming out of the Kishamaya, 
uh, of uh, prehistory. And again, that's a reflection of the feathers on the wings, the feathered serpent. And so this, this serpent dragon ideology coming out of prehistory creates uh, this race that looks like snakes. And we don't know what other traits were passed on. What we do know is as fallen angels had the ability to have a changeling quality and take the form and sex of whatever they wanted in the physical realm because they're spiritual beings, right, in a different dimension, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so um, did that changeling quality get passed on to their descendants, and is that still in existence today? Because in the reptilian mythology, whether they're aliens or they're just the royal family, they have this changeling quality. Now, that's speculation part for me from a Christian perspective, but it's a possibility of how that comes down the line and that these rebellious seraphim angels are still out there, right? Not all the ones that rebelled and produced the Nephilim were put in the abyss. Only the impassioned ones were. So that leaves other ones still around. And so the second area where I would say is there's a possibility of reptilian surviving is let's go back to the Eden story. Okay. And in the Eden story, you have a serpent uh, who deceives Eve and Adam from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which in polytheism they call that the tree of knowledge or the tree of gnosis. Mm -hmm. But it's not the being that we typically think of as a snake today, because what happens to to the serpent after that? Well, first of all, A, you could speak, and now it can't speak, right? Right. And so the arms or the limbs are taken off, or the wings. Uh, If you had a flying one, you'd have a flying dragon. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the feet are taken, and and it's forced to crawl on the belly. So this being was distinctly different before Eden. And when you get into the Gnostic Gospels, we'll talk about the serpent as being an intelligent being, uh, the and the most and it's, as what it's called in the Eden account, the craftiest of animals of the earth. Um, and it could do. It was the size of a camel, so it was bigger than a human. Uh, and it was now made inferior to humans when Adam and Eve are created. And that's why it participates in deceiving Adam and Eve in the garden. So now you have this other being. Did some of them survive as well? Huh. Very interesting. How about the whole, um, wow, that's that's interesting itself. But uh, how about the uh, reptilians? Do you believe that they're uh, around now and able to shapeshift? As people claim, uh, there's many videos out there that they yeah. show in uh, government where they are actually shape-shifting. Do you believe that's uh, possible? Uh, it, it, it's a possibility. I would put it very low, yeah. in my opinion. I don't know I don't know if they were able to keep that shape-shifting capability down through the ages. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think not, but I suppose it's possible. But it's certainly very strong uh, in the mythos. And for people that may want to um, have an idea what I'm looking at, and I understand this is... Well, this, thing I'm going to have you look at when you get a chance mm-hmm. on your own is very much diluted in terms of the bloodlines and as they're um, changing over time to take on more of the look of humans, um, even though they do intermarry all the way through to try and keep these bloodlines pure. So if you go to, and it also answer why you've got this group of kings that are always in the news. Mm-hmm. And this is the Armana dynasty. So it includes uh, two types. King Tut, Tutankhamun, and uh, Akhenaten, who is his father, right? Mm-hmm. Have a look at an Akhenaten statue of a picture. If you get a chance to go to a King Tut museum or Google it, mm-hmm. this thing has this long protruding chin that I talk about. It has this, this these high cheekbones, these slanted eyes, and this elongated skull. Okay, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, and that's at circa 1250 uh, BC, as opposed to say about 3500 BC when um, the Nephilim would have been created. So this has been diluted for a couple thousand years, and it's in Akhenaten still has that serpentine type of look. Do you have a, um, a follow button on your uh, personal page, or do you got a um, 
another uh, web page that uh, some they can go to to follow me. Yeah, I mean, just to see the like, because I know I'm friends with you on Facebook and stuff, and I know a yeah. lot of the posts and pictures you put, uh, you know, go on your personal site itself, your personal Facebook yeah. page. Yeah, that's basically how you'd get a look at some of those pictures. I do have on my website as well, on one of the chapter pages, I'll have a picture of Akhenaten as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, just look up uh, Gary Wayne uh, on yeah. Facebook and yeah. lots of uh, and, I mean, I was, I, and or www.genesis6conspiracy.com. Okay, there It'll you go. It'll be like chapter 81 or something like that for Akhenaten. Ah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, we are speaking to uh, Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis Six Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. But we are talking secret societies, and let me get round to that again and get your thoughts on, uh, do you think f uh, right now uh, the... Freemasonry is as powerful as it's ever been, um, and do you think that uh, they are the highest tier of, um, oh boy, I was going to say the elite right now in the world uh, when it comes to, you know, trying to conquer or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't see Freemasonry as being as dominant as they were, but I would say that um, the Masons are actively involved, but through other sort of groups that would be more, um, people would be more aware of, like the like the CFR, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, that basically controls foreign policy and is, is, is this whole globalist organization or the uh, Trilateral Commission, which again would have all CFR members and they're all secret society members, or the Bilderberger group, uh, two groups in, in Europe, the one that you don't see, uh, which has the pure bloods, but the Bilderberger group that will bring in new talent and um, not in noble bloodlines, let's say like a Bill Gates or somebody like that, new money. Uh -huh. uh, and they all set out an agenda once a year there to uh, move uh, the world more towards a globalist cause and try and get that done. So more through, you're seeing that reach more through the uh, the political aspect of it in terms of what they're doing. So you'll see uh, more organizations that are sponsored by these groups and funded by the tax-exempt shelters of the banks, which, you know, uh, you know <laughs> came about through the Rothschilds. And right. that's another rabbit hole to go down to. So whether it's environmental groups, that would be all part of that cause. Uh, you have um, the, the free trade things that are going on all of the time and trying to create, create these trading blocks. Um, now you also have, you know, a Jesuit pope in um, Rome today who is trying to become more politically involved with the environmental group and is talking to uh, non-Catholic Christian organizations to bring them closer together. Plus he's talking to the Muslims, plus he's talking to all of the other uh, religions and they're trying to move things together so you see that more as that sort of political sort of movement um, and you have it in scare tactics of all sorts whether or not it's global warming or uh, fear <laughs> of war I mean they're trying to scare everybody into becoming global citizens really yeah that's certainly going on that's for sure <laughs> uh, every, every single news story they're scaring you into something else um, uh, who do you think is the most predominant uh, powerhouse uh, secret society that's out there right now? Is there any one more powerful than the other at this moment in time? Yeah, I, I would still go to the uh, Rosicrucians because it, it, really? it's sort of okay. that liaison up that hierarchy, and mm -hmm. it, it works with the other groups. So even though they may seem independent, um, you know, they're still working through the Rosicrucians because that's the channel up beyond those other areas, right? Okay. Hmm. And um, I don't know if you want to answer this or not because this is something I've been, uh, and this is probably, I mean, this goes along with everything we're talking about. I've been learning a lot about this whole Scientology thing. What do you? What are your thoughts on Scientology? Is, is that, I know it's a religion, well, 
But I, I it's kind a religion. of religion. I, I look. It was started. Okay, go it on. was started by a Freemason. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, in there, yeah. and and it's a knowledge based religion, right? You're yeah. Initiated, and you're learning all of this stuff to become illuminated. And uh, you know they'll do the odd movies with some of their <laughs> famous actors that will be involved, and right. it'll kind of have their theology. Some of them will have giants in it. Uh, some, but mm-hmm. you know it, it's. It's just another Gnostic religion, right? Yeah. Uh, cult, but and, and I think more rogue than anything. But it does, still has the same roots and the same beliefs. Okay, so so you think this is just like an offset of uh, just like everything else that is cropped up, but kind of uh, a little bit more rogue than uh, some of the yeah. other secret societies. Yeah, and, so. and, and Hubbard set it up with a little bit more brainwashing and control, right? But so it's more cult-like than. Uh, the other organizations, so definitely went rogue. Oh, unbelievable! <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been. Yeah, we. I, I guess we won't get too deep into that because uh, it's very, very um, intense. What I'm seeing right now, of course, the whole Lee Remedy. Uh, I think that's how you say your name. Uh, show that's yeah. going on right now. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that show, but I've oh you know my. done a fair bit of research on Scientology, and, and it's fine. You know, you know, people need to make their choices as to what they want to believe or not. But you know, cults kind of have the same sort of look to them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it's pretty much plain as day. That's why. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll go on to a different subject, but yeah. Um, oh boy. Uh, I'm trying to think of where to go uh, next uh, with this. Um, so, so has there been any? Um, uh, how can I put this? Any kind of uh, new secret societies that have propped up in the past, um, let's say, decade, a uh, few years? That's trying to, uh, you know, rise up above anything else right now, or. No, I wouldn't say so, um, okay. although do keep an eye on what's going on with the Jesuits in the Roman Church, because the Jesuits have always been one of those organizations that um, was a little bit more power-hungry, and of course they will end up with the, with the universal religion in the beginning having significant control, because they'll actually bring, they'll be the catalyst to bring the New World Order together. So look for the religion to come through first. And their history... Um, is is a bit of push and shove with uh, Freemasonry, and in the beginning, um, they uh, there was a lot of Jesuits that were part of the the Masonic uh, group, um, but they have a falling out, and the Jesuits are trying to take control of Freemasonry, and Freemasonry pushes them out, and they basically say, look, we each have our own agenda, um, but. What you're trying to do with our organization, we don't want, so you need to go. So they push all of the Jesuits out. But it's the Jesuits that um, are trying to get control of the, the Roman Catholic Church to uh, destroy Roman Catholicism from um, within, and so change it from a monotheist religion to a polytheist religion. And, you know, if you look at... Um, you know, the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola, a couple of interesting things will stand out about him. And he was uh, a, a Basque. And if you don't know who a Basque is, mm-hmm. well, they are people that uh, actually call themselves Homo Atlantis. Uh, and they believe that they were the first settlers in Europe and in history and archaeology will will, set, will uh, verify that, and that they actually seeded the post-Diluvian Egyptian civilization and the Mesopotamian and the Scythian, and so they believe they are more ennobled of these bloodlines, so like the true sort of Aryan type of thing. Now, they also had a falling out with uh, uh, the bloodlines that moved out of the Middle East and into um, in, into Europe, but I just want to understand that the founder is not this poor knight. He's very much a Spanish knight and a noble and a Basque. And uh, by the way, the Basques have about 80% concentration of Rh negative bloodline. Now, he mm-hmm. also has a vision of Mary, uh, which again, you have to keep an eye on the Mary cults uh, that are going on and the Mary apparitions. And also, what he does is he sets up his monastic um, 
uh, monk sort of uh, orders in in uh, the 1500s, and they're going to develop the seven sacred sciences of the game right inside the church, mm-hmm. uh, which is always one of those calling cards of of how these groups are related, whether they're in the church or outside of the church. Um, and what they do is they interpret the Bible through the lens of the seven sacred sciences or philosophy. So in other words, they're going to change it and change it to an allegorical meaning from a literal meaning, which is the religion that polytheism has. And that's why Freemasonry has all of this allegory and symbolism and things like that. And so everything has a different meaning than what the uh, initial story is, just as Tolkien or... um, uh, I'm trying to think of the other fellow that was his best friend, that they wrote fairy uh, stories where there's a deeper meaning than the superficial story. And so they're going to change the Bible um, to, it's not the literal meaning, it's the encoded meaning underneath in the end time. So that's the one that is rising very quickly in power. Mm-hmm. And because it, it has it has such a large following, it is a populist movement, right? Mm-hmm. And there's nothing more that gets out of control faster, even though you might be in a larger partnership uh, than a populist movement. Huh. Interesting. Uh, now, what's interesting about him is is he's a Jesuit, uh, okay. the, uh, Pope Francis. Yeah. And uh, so some of your audience may be aware of the Catholic prophecies of Malachi. Right. And he was an Irish priest in the 12th century, and he prophesied all of these um, popes until the coming of the anti-pope or the, and, and the false prophet. Mm-hmm. And so the last pope is called the anti-pope. And um, what's interesting about uh, the anti-pope is, is you can take that to mean and translate it out of Greek if you take the word antichrist. Uh, Antichrist will mean either uh, an adversary or the opposite of Christ or a replacement Christ Mm -hmm. or a false Christ. Well, Malachi predicted that there would be two things that you'll identify the last pope with. And and numerically in order, Francis would be the last pope, but some people think there's another one yet to come. Uh, There's a disagreement that he's the last one. But anyways, the last pope, the anti-pope, would be... Uh, described as an anti-pope or a replacement pope as the first one. And for the first time since 1600 with Pope Gregory, uh, as I recall, we have a replacement pope. So Benedict is still alive, right? And the second thing is, is he would be a black pope. And people have been waiting in Catholicism for a pope to come out of Africa or America as a black pope. Well, the leader of the Jesuit is called the black pope. Really? And okay. the, the leader, yes, and the leader of the Vatican is known as the White Pope. So now we have a Jesuit in the Vatican. So you have a Black Pope and you have an anti Pope in power. So is hmm. he the true anti Pope that's going to make way for the false prophet who makes way for the New World Order and the Antichrist? Huh. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess that's to be determined. We'll see down the road of what happens. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you can see why I'm watching what he's doing in terms of becoming political, becoming more populist, yeah. changing doctrine in the church, and becoming part of the environmental movement, because nothing transcends borders more than the environment. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and I was going to say, I mean, how many times, uh, you know, when new orders come around, do does has the Bible changed its, uh, you know, story? <laughs> you know, it's, th- things are changing in there all the time. I don't know. I mean, I really can't even go back and. I mean, I'm sure you would know what the true uh, is. Is it the King James Bible that's uh, technically, um, you know, untouched or or not? Be, there, even before there, then? there is no untouched translation. Exactly. Uh, That's people what I thought. Okay. people raise the King James Bible almost to an idol standard, and yeah. the King James is, is is a good version, right? I, I mean, I think all of them are, but they all have a few issues. Right. Um, you know, I, I think you heard me mention earlier that the Freemasons like to call uh, the great architect of the universe Lucifer, and they also like to call the God of the Bible Adonai. 
So let me tell you two things. Hmm. First thing is, is in Isaiah 14, 12, in the King James Version, it, it translates day star or morning star as Lucifer. And there's only one other Bible uh, that did that before. That was the Vulgate Bible, the Latin Bible. And they, and, uh, they didn't know how to handle the translation. Jerome, who was the guy who translated St. Jerome, uh, didn't understand what the word hell l stands for or hell l h e y l e l so he used the word for venus which was lucifer and put that in um so only two bibles in the english language that or only one bible in the english language uses lucifer that's the king james bible hmm. now the second thing hmm. in the king james bible the, the other ones are all day star and morning star right okay. um so the second thing is is that in uh the bible uh, the word Adonai in Hebrew um, is actually in the Hebrew translation 427 times, and it stands for my Lord. But what the, what the King James Version does over and above that 427 times of Adonai or my Lord is it translates Yahweh 6,000 times, more than 6,000 times, as my Lord or Adonai. Hmm. And so if you look at the creation of the King James Bible, it is, you know, at that time where Freemasonry and Rosicrucian are controlling the elite and the Jesuits are controlling the elite of, of the Catholic Church. And these are the people who come together to translate the King James Bible. And I believe those are markers that are in the King James Bible. I think it's a good translation as I take it back to Greek and to uh, Hebrew. Yeah. Um, but... I know when they've changed it, right? Yeah. Just as in Acts 12, 4, they put Easter in there. Every other translation use, uses Passover. I mean, a Christian would <laughs> not use Easter. Right. That sounds for Ishtar, oh, <laughs> the <okay>. goddess, <laughs> or yeah, Ashtar, yeah, or Isis. I mean, you just oh, wouldn't boy. do that. <laughs> oh, my. And Easter is in what version? Uh, Acts 12, or King... King James Version, it says it will Easter say Easter, it. Oh, okay, and okay. it comes up, and the Hebrew word is Passover, Right. and right. every other translation will use the word Passover, and what the Masons like to do <laughs> is they like to leave their markers in the things that they translate, uh -huh. and they're just subtle. Of course. <laughs> It's secret, you know. So uh, It's secret, absolutely. Yeah. They're very good, and, and what most people don't know is, is that they... I mean, there would be some orders that wouldn't use the King James Bible in Freemasonry, but that's the standard one that they would hand, hand out. And they've got two two Bibles. One is, is the one for the initiate that has to start on the first degree and climb the ziggurat of initiation. And they'll give them a King James Bible that, you know, has the, and I'm looking at one right now, um, you know, it has uh, the, the Freemasonry, you know, iconology on it, but it's got additional pages for explanation in front, and it's also got Bible passages for them to study as mm -hmm. part of their initiation and part of their history. Mm -hmm. And then there's another Bible that the adept get, and that has the Polychronicon added on it, and that has their history overlaid on it. So they use the King James Bible as part of their platform to go from the oral traditions to written traditions and have the expanded version. Um, and actually, when the King James Bible first came out in 1610, it was covered with Freemasonry um, uh, symbolism and stuff like that, and they had to pull it back and put it out six months later again without all of that iconology on it. Um, so, mm -hmm. and when I'm doing, when I was doing research for the book, I would be reading, you know, whether it's like uh, Robert Lomas or. Uh, other uh, Masonic historians, and they would refer to something in the King James Bible, and I'd go look up that verse, and it's not there. Uh, but then again, those are adept, so they have this expanded version that I'd love to get my hands on, but mm -hmm. you can't, um, uh, and, and see what's in it. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to go, uh, I, I got a very cool question by Dave uh, that I am going to ask in a, in a minute, but uh, I did want to get your... Uh, what you, how you felt on the uh, Bible itself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, if everything comes from Freemasonry, uh, the whole Jesus Christ coming, our sins, the Lord, the Bible being uh, the Word of God, I mean, do you really believe, and I know it's sensitive, but, I mean, do you believe that the Bible is actually uh, 
the word of God or or is it just something that was put together perhaps by the Freemasons uh, to put forth their plan? No, I mean, the, the Bible we have today, they worked on the King James Version Bible, but uh, these transcripts were, were from before. So um, it's something that they've co-opted mm-hmm. uh, to, to uh, uh, be part of what they believe, but then take it in a different direction. So number one. Number two, uh, yes, I do believe that the Bible is um, the word that came down to certainly different writers and different prophets in the book, because you got many different prophets and many right. different scribes okay. Okay. taking it down. But mm-hmm. uh, as you take those records back into at least as far back as records that we have, they're, they're essentially undisturbed, right? They're the same way they were. So amazing um, record keeping of, of not having changes sort of take place over time. So yes, I do believe that. And I also believe that the Bible is not in contradiction. And so I know a lot of people like to look at uh, the contradictions in the Bible. I'm a contrarian, so... Well, it's changed I, so many times, too, so... Yeah, so when know. I find what seems to be a contradiction, I, to satisfy myself, I have to resolve it. Right. And, and I, I've not been able to unresolve those issues, but sometimes that will run against sort of the status quo doctrine. Hmm. Okay, so, I mean, you do believe but, it was the word of the, the God who... Uh, is whatever uh, heaven, uh, but but the yeah. fr- uh, the thing is, the Freemasons wanted to over want to eventually the end days come to overthrow uh, yes. the the Almighty Lord and yes. uh, you know so how how have they not or have they manipulated the Bible over the years? You think they would have got their hands into that? Well. Again, they look at Christianity as their biggest opposing force, right? So yes, they would want to do it, and they're always, uh, you know, at work against Christianity. Um, but because we have these ancient records, if they did try, we, they weren't all that successful. Okay. And you have to remember, monotheism was really a small religion in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Until it expands through the Roman Church. So you have Judaism or the Israel religion in this small little country in the Middle East right right up to 2000, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, the first coming of, of, of our Messiah. And then you have the New Covenant and you have the additional scripture that becomes the New Testament, right? right. So um, you can definitely say that, you know, uh, well, I would say for both, but I mean, you've got records of that Old Testament that go back to about 700 BC, and they're undisturbed. And even though the traditions written down are um, available as to for us today, as you know, for the New Testament, mm-hmm. is that there's still a consistency in there in between the Gospels and and the times that they're credited for the surviving copies that they have to be written down that there's there's not a contradiction in there so um there's a bit of faith involved there but i you know i don't i don't i don't have an issue with what it says or that it it has it doesn't say anything um it's not anywhere close to what the religion of the freemasons are or have (laughs) Uh, i mean they, they take everything and take it in a completely different direction so yeah Okay, uh, good enough. <laughs> but uh, they no. will draft Jesus, though, into their belief system as well. Hmm. Well, only they, they draft him as a mortal prophet, an enlightened prophet like uh, Zoroaster or Hermes or Buddha or, uh, you know, some of the great philosophers like Plato and Pythagoras that they like to elevate as, as, as the Greek uh, religion as well. Um, but they believe that he was not the son of God. They just believe that he was the mortal son of Mary, which will be some of the verses that they point to for their initiative study in the Bible, Mm -hmm. focusing on the son and as, as a mortal nature. And, um, they believe that, uh, he did not die on the cross, uh, that he was crucified, but that he was taken down from the cross before, um, he died. And then he was nursed, uh, back together, 
nurse back to health and married Mary Magdalene afterwards and had several children, hmm. with Josephes being the one that is most important and uh, carries on the bloodline that marries into the Camelot dynasties, uh, which is why you have all of these uh, tales of King Arthur. That's why you've got all of the genealogies encoded in there. And at the point of... Um, Amin Anabad of the Merovingian dynasty, one of the daughters of uh, the descendants of Josephes, will marry into the Merovingian bloodline. And uh, out of that, after the Merovingians fall, you have, this is their belief system, um, a survivor named Dagobert, uh, who is uh, the ancestor of Godfrey de Bouillon, who is one of the founders of the Knights Templar. Oh, okay. You know, one more question, because I have to ask you uh, before I get to Dave's question, which will take us on a different uh, uh, path here. But um, so who do you think Jesus Christ was? Well, he's the uh, word that came from God, okay, number you, one, okay. uh, and went back to him. So he is he is the Redeemer. So you have, uh, you know, when, when you have the... And, Again, even Christianity isn't, isn't monolithic on how they define the Holy Spirit, uh, the Word, and God. But when God speaks, that's the Word. Right? So, was it, so, so is he a prophet when, or when was people, he the When Lord Christians Son? talk about Jesus creating the world, mm -hmm. he's the Word who creates the world, right? Okay, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, do, but do you believe he's uh, the Lord's actual son, or do you believe he was a prophet and spoke uh, the Word of God? Well, he, he is the word that was transplanted into Mary. So, yes, I believe he is the word of God. Uh, he okay. is a son of God and a servant of God in a sp spiritual sense. Okay. And so he gets put into a vessel in, in who becomes Jesus on earth. But he's still the word of God, right? And that's why it right. says in the book of John, you know, the word came from God and went back to him, right? And on Revelation, it will say on Jesus' belt when he comes back at, at Armageddon, will have his name on it, which is the Word of God. Okay, good enough. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I jump all over the place. I need to uh, you know, ask certain questions. but yeah. um, let's... Now, Jesus was also a prophet, but he was still, I mean, mm -hmm. he, is, he is so much above angels and, and everything else. And okay. the distinction, but there is a distinction between him and God, just as he's called the branch, and he's the first creation, as it talks about in Proverbs and other verses I could give you, but I won't bore your audience with that. So, yes, I do believe <laughs> okay. yeah. he is the spiritual son of God, absolutely, not the physical son of God. Okay, okay. Well, you know, this is uh, from Dave Pluffe from uh, Paranormal Into the Night. Um, he asked a question. It's going to be a little different, but um, maybe an odd question, he says, but what do, does the guest think of uh, popular horror stories such as Dracula, which really yeah. is a story about bloodlines? Does, yeah. that, does that correlate with secret, yep. secret societies of England in any way at all? Absolutely it does. Um, everything that is done in our literature, for the most part, mm -hmm. is, is an allegory of bloodlines and secret societies and, and our history. And so I'll start with Prince Charles, um, and I have a posting on uh, one of my Genesis 6 pages on this. He actually... Uh, and a link to the to the story. He's declared himself many times to be the ancestor of Vlad the Impaler. Okay, so Dracula hmm. is based on Vlad the Impaler. So I've just done bloodlines and Dracula connected them together, right? <laughs> right. Now, now I think it goes way deeper than that. That's just the the tip of the iceberg. So, um, <laughs> good bring so it. So he's. <laughs> I'm going to bring it. So Dracula um, is. Uh, when you put the A on Dracul, Dracul is for dragon, and A stands for son of a dragon. So you have Vlad the second and Vlad the third. One's the father, one's the son. Mm -hmm. And so the Rosicrucians are a big part of setting up an order in 1408 called the Sarkhan Iran, uh, R E N D, and they also name it Ordo Draconis. Okay, so you got dragon coming back in. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're going to do is start to push their kingships back on the throne again because they're being pushed off from either a different faction of bloodlines or non-ennoble bloodlines. It's not clear to me which. Uh, and they also want to advance the pursuits of thought 
This is in 1408. So this is the readvancement of knowledge and science again, right? Pursuits mm-hmm. of thought, which is Egyptian. And they initiate um, Vlad into the Sarkaniron or the Ordo Draconis. Now, Vlad the Impaler was um, educated at the Mystery School of Solomon in Austria. That Vlad the Impaler had pale skin, hazel eyes, and uh, green eyes and red hair. And you remember earlier in the show, I said that was the other color of the Nephilim. Right. The Nephilim also drank blood. Mm-hmm. Nef- uh, drug, blood drinking is also a significant ritual in Freemasonry at the adept level in secret societies. Uh, and they drank the blood to try and extend their lives. And these are the Nephilim in the antediluvian period after they lost their immortal spirit. So they're descending generations after um, God steps in in Genesis 6 and limits life to 120 years. They start to drink blood to try and maintain their immortality and to increase their cognitive abilities. Nimrod, who is the first Grand Master of Freemasonry, writes the first constitution of Freemasonry after the flood, and Babel is the first sort of manifestation of the fifth science of Masonry, um, the Tower and the City of Babel. Uh, he reinstitutes the mystical religion and the blood drinking ritual that has streamed down through history ever since. So now you have. Uh, the idea of you want to connect the serpents in here and the dragons, that's where Dracula comes in, right? Now you have the blood drinking, and now you put the fangs of the cobra on uh, the, the standard sort of Dracula or vampire motif. Uh, and, of course, the cobra is a significant factor of the Egyptian uh, um, kingship, and you complete the allegory of the, the blood-sucking Nephilim. Uh, and in... Taking that even one step further is is you have two significant allegories that they call in terms of the bloodlines coming down through history. You have the patriarchal bloodline of the kings, which is the dragon bloodline, or the raven bloodline, and you have the matriarchal bloodline, which is the fairy allegory and the owl allegory, just as Lilith is a a night-flying witch or an oupier, uh, or uh, an overlord, which is the same thing that Vlad Va- the Paler was, and also a blood drinking vampire. Hmm. And I do, could go deeper still with it. Do you do you think that that blood drinking had worked for some of these uh, throughout the the years? And do you think there are some who continue to be immortal on the planet? Well, I know they're not going to be immortal. It may prolong uh, their life prolong their life, but that would be about it. And what's really interesting is you get the law set up with uh, the ancient um, nation of Israel after the flood. They have a a few very specific sets of laws that are grouped together where you're not allowed to drink blood, Mm -hmm. you're not allowed to worship idols, you're not allowed to strangle um, animals, uh, because that was, again, uh, all of those were significant traits of what uh, Nephilim with their mystical religion did. Uh, so so there could be vampires, uh, technically, in the term, uh, still around, right? Um, well, certainly from an allegorical perspective and yeah, from right. a ritual perspective, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I'm not convinced there's vampires. I think that's just, uh, okay. you know, allegories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Monsters so, of myth, yeah. But it, there is a place in... Uh, the whole blood drinking still uh, in some of these secret societies, even to this day, though, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you take um, a word called strigoi, uh, S-P-R-I-G-O-I, back to Romania, Transylvania, um, that's a word for witch uh, and popular for a vampire. And that has its roots in uh, Latin as strix, S-T-R-I-X, meaning screech owl. And if you take Lilith that comes out of the Bible, that's in Isaiah, uh, that actually goes back to Hebrew as, as a screech owl, uh, an unclean owl that hops like a goat. Hmm. And that connects back to uh, further back into history as a Lamia, L-A-M-I-A, which is a blood-sucking demon and a female 
Upier that I had talked about just a few minutes ago. And it flew at night like a screech owl in Greek mythology. And it was a killer of infants and did child sacrifice and, and drank blood. And, of course, that's what Lilith was, was, uh, was a Lamia. You know, I could probably get you on here to talk uh, one of these days just on uh, Greek mythology alone, right? Oh, yeah. You yeah. know what? Uh, if, if you're up to it uh, another time, I would love to talk about that with you uh, down the road here. Let you do sure. some, some more of your shows because, man, you're a busy man. <laughs> and you've been doing <laughs> a lot of different shows. And I've listened to some of them. So, I mean, there's something different in everything, you know, every show you've been doing. So, yeah. and, and I take you things know, a little bit different. I'm back and forth on it. But that's what makes me, uh, my yeah. show, a little bit different. So, yeah. yeah. And I came across all of this information just because of writing the book and asking right. questions and, and saying, okay, how is that, you know, connected to this? And that sounds similar. And then you ask more questions and it just keeps opening more and more doors. And you see that there's such a common history that just people haven't connected. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, my. Very interesting. So I think that's what's going to happen uh Next one will be about Greek mythology, and uh, th that I'd be excited to hear, uh, too. Um, anything you want to get out uh, before I let you go here, Gary, um, uh, to whoever's is, listening no, here? No, is there another question coming out of the chat room or anything like that? Um, um, no, um, not at the moment. I don't see any. No questions, you guys. <laughs> Um, yeah. They're listening intently, but this will go up on iTunes, YouTube, and everywhere else on the website, and it, so it will be out there. So everybody will be, uh, you know, people tend to listen to my show um, uh, after it goes up on iTunes for sure. It, it sure. gets a lot yeah. of listens, but uh, you know how that goes. It's either uh, you get your following on YouTube, iTunes, yeah. um, you know, the live listeners on a Saturday Night and Spreaker is, uh, you know. Not easy to come by, but uh, so be it. That's why I get it yep. up on all these other sites. But um, well, I'll leave yeah. I'll leave a couple other just pointers on um, a little bit about secret societies for maybe people to uh, research into a little bit or okay. think about. Is that I mean it was uh, Rosicrucians and the, and the Masons who came up with this idea called social masonry that. Uh, started communism and then national socialism mm -hmm. and that came about by working with uh, you know the Fabian Society and the Theosophical uh, groups out of England and the Rosicrucians right and what's interesting about that is it also included uh, as, we're, as, as I was talking about the rise of national socialism in the 1800s this is the, the same period of time and there's another interesting group that uh, people should be aware of uh, that was coming together at the same time called the Rhodes Society. Okay. Um, Cecil Rhodes, who was uh, the gold and diamond baron, uh, De Beers Diamonds, that was his company. He was Illuminati, and he set up the round table that also worked with the Fabian Society to set up the inquiry, which uh, then later became the CFR that was funded by the Rothschilds. And uh, he was a very, very important figure back then and his society today funding new talent um, is always looking for new talent to draft in and put through uh, school and to draft into the globalist cause and so Bill Clinton would be one of noteworthy who was a Rhodes Scholar and uh, the Fabian Society this was a group that was established that established the Labour Party in England eventually but it developed a lot of progressive elites and worked with uh, Golden Dawn and other Rosicrucian groups as well in England and established things like social justice that you hear a lot about today. They came up with the idea of eugenics, uh, doing abortion, universal health care, national socialism. Um, and uh, these were all of the groups that were working together that started, that funded all of these splinter groups. That's why you don't see Freemasonry uh, as pre predominant as what it used to be because they're working through all of these other trust groups mm -hmm. and societies and political groups. And so that's why they're not nearly as prominent. But there's just so many different groups that are out there. 
Oh, yeah. But Freemasonry has a, a hand in them, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, that's, a, that's a training ground for uh, the <laughs> exactly. occultists. Like, um, if you're not a pure blood, you need to go through there. Uh, hmm. Wow. Interesting. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, you know what, Gary? I think we're going to end the show here. Um, it's okay. up, uh, two hours just about flew by. I want to get a little bit of information out before I end at mm-hmm. one o'clock. Um, but, um, yeah, again, I thank you very much for coming on and talking to me, uh, as always. Um, again, go to Amazon. The links are everywhere, everybody. Uh, if you see this link for this show anywhere, it's there. Um, get his book, uh, The Genesis Six Conspiracy. How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. And, um, yeah, you put Gary Wayne into Google and it will come up. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> guaranteed. Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. You, you can have your choice of shows. Go to YouTube and put Gary Wayne in there. And, um, oh, my God, there will be so many shows to listen to. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we've given your audience uh, something to chew on tonight and a few things to think about. I know we covered uh, a lot of uh, topics uh, in and around the secret societies, but yeah, um, hopefully sure. they enjoyed the conversation. Oh, for sure, yeah. I, I can't wait to get some uh, some feedback. I'm sure I will. I always I did last time you were on, so uh, it'll be Good. interesting um, for sure. So, yeah, Gary, uh, thank you very, very much for coming back on with me. I appreciate it. Very happy to have come and uh, look forward to coming back again. Okay, uh, for sure, Gary. I I will keep in contact with you, okay? Thank you. Okay, take care. Good night. Good night. Okay, there you go. Uh, Gary Wayne, and I tell you, man, um, this guy is unbelievable. I'm just always amazed every time I hear him go on and talk about all this complex stuff. Someone like me, I can't wrap my head around a lot of this stuff. So um, just to have him come on is just uh, amazing and talk about all this. That's why I, I hope hopefully he'll come back on and uh, talk to me about um, Greek mythology because that's another subject that I just love. Um, but, yeah, uh, what else can I tell you guys? Um, please uh, go to, if, if you're listening on Spreaker right now and you made it to the end of the show, uh, please give us a follow, okay? Hit that follow button on the page and become a follower and, uh, you know, you'll be notified every time a new show comes up. And also, Monday night, uh, me and Ted are doing our show, The Darkening. It's uh, me and Ted, uh, Ted Workman, Dino Ewell, your host here. We will be talking about uh, the Slender Man murders and a whole lot more. Uh, anybody who knows what um, I've been doing here for I don't know how long now, um, <laughs> over the past, oh, geez, has it been almost two years? Uh, probably no uh, everything I do, I've ha- I have my hands dabbling in I don't know how many different things, um, and I'm trying to limit it right now to uh, the radio side of it and the paranormal shows, um, which will get a little bit better produced in the future here. Uh, but hey, it's all about the guests and their stories and what they got to say, and uh, yeah, because I have. Um, the Darkening, I got Voices Carry on Wednesday. So you go to PITN Radio Network. You could uh, go to the website, www.pitnradionetwork.com, or find Paranormal Into the Night on Facebook and join or like the page. And, yeah, so uh, next week, uh, who do I got on next week? I am in Cleveland. Okay, you guys know that. I'm freezing here. It's cold out. Um... Even though I'm in my little office here, which is kind of cool, it's still uh, a little chilly. It's just the way it works when you're 15 feet down in a bunker, <laughs> as Art Bell would say. Uh, no, he did he say the bunker? Nah, maybe not. Um, but he had a shack. That's right. He had his own building. 
Um, let's see. Next week, I am... Oh, this is going to be very, very cool, you guys. Uh, next week, I am going to have Simon Entwistle on. He is from the UK, and he does ghost tours, okay? So this is going... He's got tons and tons of ghost stories that he will be talking about. And, uh, yeah, Simon Entwistle. Okay, I'll be putting a, a links and all that good stuff up on Paranormal Into the Night and PITN Radio Network. So uh, be sure to check out next week's show. It's going to be, uh, this guy's a, a hoot. It's going to, as they say in the old country, this guy's a hoot. <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, let's see what did Dave say in the chat. Thank God. Uh, oh, let me see. I, I'm going to stand up here a second, you guys. I got stuff going on all over. Uh, he said, thank God we froze last week. It was in the, the 50s, and we actually had rain. Um, I'm not sure where you're at, Dave. But, yeah, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and we've had some beautiful weather. I mean, it really is be been beautiful weather. 50s, 60 degrees in, um, you know, January. I mean, come on. But uh, we got a week of, like, really cold weather coming here, and... Luckily, there's not a lot of snow, so that's one good thing. But, um, yeah, I guess I'm babbling on here just a little bit. Uh, I, I do also have the Late Late Horror Show on YouTube. If you like horror commentaries, uh, I do do that with Ted, uh, my co-host on The Darkening. I, I love the title. Hopefully, you guys uh, leave me some feedback, what you guys uh, think of the name and the show. Uh, that, that one's going to take a, a little bit longer to get a following it's, since it's brand new. But anybody who's uh, you know still listening, uh, a lot of you, Dave's probably still listening, but uh, a lot of people may have jumped off already. Um, yeah, and I'm saying I'm a lot, and you know what? It's because I'm, I'm very, very tired, you guys. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm rambling on. And uh, yeah, it's been a, a long week for me. <laughs> And uh, I'm getting a little giddy here. Uh, so what more can I say? I guess I'm going to end the show. And uh, what am I going to do next? I guess nothing until Monday. I might get on my YouTube channel, The Late Late Horror Show, um, and do a live stream on The Late Late Horror Show with a couple people tomorrow night. Uh, just chanting about some horror, uh, horror movies and stuff like that. I went and seen Split. Uh, I see that Russ McGovern is in the chat uh, on Paranormal Until the Night. The night's just uh, getting started. Russ, I, I I hear you, buddy, but I've been on for two hours with uh, Gary Wayne, and it was an awesome interview. If you didn't catch it, I'll go back and uh, listen to it. And, uh, man, I, I, I feel like I still need to get back into the flow of this thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you see, I said, um. See, you're not supposed to say um on the radio, but I say it. But you know what? I'm a real person. I've never been trained in radio. I've never um, done any kind of broadcast. This is all comes from me being an Art Bell fan and starting this Paranormal Into the Night channel or group on Facebook. And all of this came from that. And I'm a very antisocial person, believe it or not. So for me to even get on here and, and talk to people like this and do interviews, and uh, I, I think everybody who does like gary and and everybody else everybody knows who they are uh just great great people and uh almost uh to be the witching hour yeah uh I'm, well let's see it's twelve fifty nine here russ i'm not sure where you're at buddy uh, uh but i'm in on the east coast here and it is one o'clock in the morning yeah so it's it's late um, the, the darkening on Monday is a little bit earlier. It's 9 p.m. Eastern. And that's kind of going to be kind of, I'm not going to have guests. It's going to be just me and uh, my co-host Ted there uh, going back and forth, shooting off each other. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, we started a show calling it Any Given Monday. And I didn't kind of, I kind of didn't like that. Uh, there's another podcast out there called Any Given Monday, so and it kind of didn't go with what we wanted. We kind of wanted to stick to crime, uh, horror, and stuff like that, and paranormal. So that's why I changed it to The Darkening. So uh, the official first show will be next Monday, even though we did a show on serial killers this past 
uh, Monday. Uh, it was just a trial by error thing. And uh, so a first official show Monday. And I guess I'm going to let you guys, let's see, what did uh, Russ say here in chat again? I'm in uh, Connecticut, I believe. Yeah, 100 here. To, oh, wait. CT Central. Okay. Uh, with that said, I am going to get out of here and I will see everybody on Monday, the darkening, and then next week, paranormal into the night. Everybody take care.